Are we live? Can you hear us? Can you can you hear me? Can I I I am sure there is some delay, so please people in the audience, participants, can you tell me whether you can hear hear me? Whether the sound is okay. I can hear you, the sound is okay. Yeah, but let's let's see if the audience can hear us. I'll write something. Yeah, there's some delay. Okay. Uh, the has just come to ah, okay, so now there it's because there is some delay. Okay, uh, yeah, so Hi, we're, we are very glad. Sorry, Len. Okay, we are very glad to welcome you all here to this third session of the Brain Circuit uh, Brains Through Time uh, Reading Club. Uh, so we have a great uh, panelist, a great panel today. We will now uh, do a short introduction or. or brief introduction of the of this of the chapter and then we will have the the speakers uh, telling us more about the cerebellum and the telencephalon but i am going ahead because alex will explain us more in details this so we will share a screen now i uh, will yeah you can share a screen alex doesn't work. I think we lost uh, Luis. Oh no, Luis just... Ah, oh, he's here, okay. Okay. Doesn't work. No, you are mute. You are mute. How? How? No, 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 it's fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. So, well, welcome everyone again to the third session of the Reading Club of the book Brings Through Time by George Streeter and Len Norcut. Thank you every. Th thank you all very much for coming. And as you can see, and as Manuel said, we have a very amazing panel of experts today, and we are really looking forward to continue this travel about, uh, about brain evolution. So. I'm going to do a quick introduction to, to the event, which is organized by Manuel Molano, postdoc in computational, Raquel Garcia, PhD working on neuroscience, and me, Alex, working on brain development and evolution. So, as you see, uh, we come from very different fields and we joined the, in the organization of this reading club, uh, aiming to, to learn about the evolutionary history of the, vertebr of the vertebrate brains, and especially to promote discussion between these different fields about the consequences of that such history has for, for our understanding of modern brains. So to do so, this book is ideal as it covers very nicely the, this history from early vertebrates to, to us primates. And we have already reviewed a couple of, of these chapters. In case you miss them or you want to review them, you, you can find them on YouTube, on our webpage or social media. And for today's session, uh, we are going to talk about natostomes or jot fish, reviewing the main traits of these fish brains and how they were shaped during their evolution and, and their diversification. So to this end, we count with uh, an amazing panel of experts, Len Mahler, is professor at Ottawa University, and Idoya Quintana Urthanki, postdoctoral fellow at Heidelberg, at Heidelberg University, and also, as always, Luis Poyas and, and Paul Sisek. So uh, we will start with a short chapter summary by Raquel Garcia, followed by two discussion blogs. In each one of these blogs, our panelists will highlight some important or controversial aspect of the chapter. So Len is going to talk us about cerebellar function in teleost, and Idoya is going 
to to talk us about how what sharks can teach us about telencephalic evolution. So uh, finally, we will have uh, an open Q and A question. If you want to participate in it, you can use the uh, Ask a Question button featuring uh, featuring Crowcast. You can find it uh, on the bottom part of the screen. We'll keep an eye on, uh, we will keep an eye on, on them and might invite you to join the stage. Uh, we will invite you to the stage by default. So if you prefer not to join the stage, you can tell us in your questions, put no stage between brackets or something like that. So we can read it to the, the question to the panelist. Uh, well, now just thanks you all and all the panelists again, Worldwide Neuro, and without further ado, I leave the stage to, to Raquel. So I'll close this. You're listening properly, true? Yeah, but we are not seeing what you're presenting. Yeah, you need you need to share the screen. Yeah, one second. I don't know if there is a delay or something. Broadcast. Okay now. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, and also the curve, no? Yes. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Welcome everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, I don't want to, let's just start. So I wanted to start with a quote, which I assume everyone here would agree with, that this nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So let's see if we can set some light on the evolution of the brain and how it can help us to understand it better. Uh, last chapter, we talk, uh, we talk about cyclostomes, lampreys and half fishes, and the most basal extant vertebrates. It was a very exciting chapter and discussion, and you can see it again in our YouTube channel. Today, we are going to go to the next step, nanthostomes, or your vertebrates, which include a myriad of species. Your fishes can be uh, divided in cartilaginous fishes and bony fishes. The former include air sacs, rays, and olencephalons, and are characterized, as the name indicates, by having a cartilaginous skeleton. Among bony fishes, we can distinguish, distinguish ray, fine, ray, ray fin fish, sorry, including basal lineages like the polypteriforms and estragions, and the most numerous and diverse fish lineages, the uh, teleost. On the other hand, we also have uh, land fishes and silicon, from which tetrapods distant. But what about their ecology? Nantostomes started diversifying and the, and the, during the Silurian and the end of the Ordovicians, where temperatures uh, were rising here in, in black after a global ice period, and OC11 were also rising. You can see here that after this period, a uh, lot of rats started to appear. It was such a good time to be a fish that the Devonian is often called the age of fishes. But what benefits they got from the yaws? Their newly evolved jaws and paired fins gave them several advantages adaptation that al allowed their great di diversification. For example, increased swimming and steering ability, allowing them to better avoid predators and even catch prey, together with the jaws. Jaws also maximize the water flow across the, grill, the gills, increasing efficiency in gas exchange. And indeed, jaws were most likely developed to improve respiration and were only later used to hunt. Here it's also important to say that uh, some nanostomes were heavily harmored, like Duncleostus, indicating that they were also preyed upon by larger fishes or invertebrates. However, many of these lineages uh, become extinct after the massive extinction of the end of the Devolium, as you can see here. So, this selective pressure uh, in this fish eat fish wall probably shaped their evolution and behavior. Now we will see that all of this was accompanied by an overall improvement in sensory organs. Uh, let's start with photoreception. Early natostomes retain their pair, their pair eyes from their ancestors, but probably suffered a duplication or on, the rhodopsy, on, on the rhodopsy genes. Thanks to this, they were most likely capable of color vision in dim and in bright light. A horizontal or, uh, expansion also helped them see it over, over the distant floor, sea floor. Nowadays, they exhibit a wide range of adaptations, such as them fields, being able to see UV light thanks to specialized photoreceptors. About chemical senses, they had bilateral nasal sacs, high-inherited olfactory and nasal receptors from the ancestors. 
which then they expanded to increase their session range, developing new class of this kind of receptor and also amino associated ones. This sensor information was likely used uh, by external tostones to sense other and emitted by prey or other individuals of the same species. They might have it used to navigate long distances, as do extant shark, for instance, to return home or track prey. We will speak a bit more about, the uh, about this when the telecephalo comes. About the vestibular sensing and hearing, the vestibular sense very importantly involved independently in nastostomes and cyclostomes. In your feces, uh, it has a pair of semicircular canals together with uh, two fluid filled chambers called saculus and nutricle. And it has uh, a relatively conserved structure between bony feces and cartilaginous feces. They also contain patches of hair sensitive to acceleration and direction, increasing their precision and allowing them to maintain body posture during swimming. Hearing uh, sense uh, is also thanks to this utriculum and saculus. About the lateral nine system uh, of Lelin astrosomes included both mechanosensory and electrosensory components inherited from the Yoles ancestors, but they suffered several modifications leading to substantial changes in sensory instability. About the mechanosensory lateral line is what you can see in this picture. The lamprey has neuromast with hair cells, but now uh, your feces has also a gelatinous cupola surrounding the hair, making them more sensitive to water currents. Also, they have developed uh, canal neuromast not only in the surface and not only in the head, but also all along the trunk, giving, line to the, uh, giving the name to this sensor line. Neuromass tend to respond to the amplitude, direction, and extent of water displacement, and canal neuromast respond mainly to pressure differential between the canal pores. Curiously, uh, damage to this lateral line has not effect on swimming, suggesting that this is specialized uh, mainly for short range of moving and even environment recognition. About the electrosensory line, just to say that has also evolved, evolved since lampreys and the, the receptors are not in the surface of the skin. They are located at the bottom of a mucus filled channels called ampullae. This sense was lost in vertebrates as they move onto land. What about movement and motor control? Well, they remained from their ancestors the ill like form of swimming, as you can see here, lateral undulation. However, they increased the traveling wave near the tail. So most of the propulsion was generated by the tail fin. The other fins are just for body stabilization and smooth deceleration. There are different shapes, as you can see in the image, like S start and C start, but the C start is the most extended and studied. And in fact, it takes just 12 milliseconds from the stimulus to the muscle to contract. This is also facilitated by myelin interaction, a novelty respect cyclostomes. But the question is, what about the origin and movement of the jaws? Well, there are two hypotheses. One hypothesis, and the one you can see here in this picture, is based mainly in comparative morphology. The upper and lower elements of the first gill arc probably tilted forward and eventually extend to the front of the head. So most components who have homologous in jawless vertebrate, but the thing is that they are a bit difficult to hurt. Due to this, there is also an alternative hypothesis uh, that says that the rostral boundary of a gene called FGF Eight here in red is shifted caudally in nastosomes, and this causes a caudal shift in other gene called, called uh, BMP. So this ultimately leads to the novel tissue interaction that produces a novel upper jaw element. Because the, the, this debate is difficult to, to say much about the evolution of the muscle that open and close the jaws. But we can uh, say for sure that in any case, the muscles that control the principal jaws are consistently innervated by the trigeminal motor nucleus. So now uh, let's speak about the brain. Uh, why did major revision of nastostomes diverge so much? The simplest answer is that they mermaids become adapted to different niches, living, living in different habitats, eating different kinds of food, and pursuing different reproductive strategies. To follow up during the presentation, we will use the dogfish brain to go through different parts of the brain. And we are going to start with the medulla, as the book does, and also we are going to go from the most posterior part of the brain to the most anterior. So what about the medulla? In lampreys, probably occupied half of the brain, but in early young feces, at least one third. It is very vascularized and contributes to the generation of cerebrospinal fluid. It has ventromedial and, uh, and dorsolateral division, unlike the spinal cord. 
and in fact a good schema is to divide the medulla into alar sensory in red and basal motor regions here in gray with an exception. This structure is very similar across all your faces and indeed all across vertebrates. Some of the exemptions, and this uh, example of the goldfish, that have hypertrophied son of fifth division. What you see here is, in fact, medulla. This is called vagal love, uh, vagal love and is related to taste. About the cerebellum, lampreys do not have a proper cerebellum, but they did have cerebellum-like structure that all your fishes retain. Uh, here in blue, you can see uh, surrounded in, in blue the cerebellum-like structure, and this is a proper cerebellum. But what is the characteristic to be cerebellum-like or proper cerebellum? Well, non-proper cerebellum, is here is in the schema, consists of numerous granule cells and principal cells that remind us to purkinje, but they are excitatory rather than inhibitory. So it is precisely this uh, characteristic uh, that rules it out as true cerebellum. The proper cerebellum is this schema here, uh, has also these granule cells, parallel fibers, and real Purkinje cells, inhibitory. And uh, we see the curious and conserved phenomenon in, also in tetrapods, long-term depression in the neighboring cells, when a parallel fiber makes an action potential in the Purkinje cell, critical for motor learning. Now the question is, did this cerebellum came from cerebellum-like structure? The, answer, the first answer is no, and pro uh, probably they arose independently. And the following question, so it is, so what advantages they have to have a proper cerebellum? Adaptative motor control. By using sensory reflexes and plasticity, they were uh, able to better modulate motor reflexes. Uh, and despite this very concern, just to say that there are also some variations, like the elephant fish, uh, who has this valvula, links to electro electrosensory processing. Uh, the midbrain roof and tegmentum are the most studied part of your feces, in particular the optic tentum. The optic tentum is what you see here in this representation, has a balloon-shaped structure, in, uh, more or less conserved, and forms most of the midbrain roof. It is homologous to the superior colliculus of mammals. It usually receives projection from the contralateral retina, with some exceptions, as always, and has motor output. Interestingly, also received from the lateral line, an auditory system. So, the most widely served function is probably to orient the fish head and eyes toward external stimuli. And despite has a general structure, you can see in the, in the schema, again, in the red dots, that uh, there is a de uh, variable degree of tectal lamination. About the toros semicircularis, uh, it is similar to inferior colliculus in mammals. It is attributed the function of conveying auditory information and sending it to the optic tectum, but also received from other modalities, like the lateral line, auditory region here in the A, and from motor areas. It also exhibits diversity, and in some electric animals, is more expanded. Here, like you can see in the binotid, which is an electrical fish. Uh, has a more laminar structure rather than nuclear, uh, and also as you can see here in the Golgi staining neurons. What about the encephalo? Well, uh, we have a structure that are more dorsal and others that are more ventral. In the dorsal, we can find pretectum, thalamus, and pretalamus. And ventrally, ven ventrally, there is the posterior tuberculum. We are going to focus in the one that are labeled in the image. About the pretectum, you have to say that was small and with very little cellular diversity, with a function similar to the optic tectum. In teleos, for example, it has been expanded in several nuclei, like this nucleus glomerulosus, that has a special age arrangement of dendrites and synapses, and it has been, to, uh, has been suggested to play a role in visual object perception, maybe an adaptation to living in reefs and shallow water. About the posterior tuberculum, it already appears in lampreys with an olfatory function, since, since it receives from the olfatory bulb. This function has also been seen in teleos and lamp fishes. So we can conclude that was a primitive function. But again, it has developed variation uh, in different lineages. For example, in here, in the rain fine fishes, there is a nucleus medianus and torus lateralis here, which is projection resembles to the mammalian thalamus, despite this not homologous to it, as project to encephalic pallium and receive a lot of sensory input. Finally, about the thalamus, we don't know. Uh, we know little about it, but we know that it was small and simple, and also associated with vision, as is the case of ratfishes. Uh, about the hypothalamus, uh, it's a relatively small, small structure, as you can see here, 
in lampreys and has remained so in bony and tetrapods. However, it's a bit bigger in cartilaginans and teleosts. Receive mainly uh, sensory input, as you can see in the picture, from mechanosensory and electrosensory from this anterior nucleus, and olfatory and polysens polysensory from the telencephalon, the pallium and subpallium, and projects to celeberum, suggesting in bait integrate other inputs. Regarding its function, this characteristic, together with the expression of neuropeptidae, here in red you can see the cells and the fibers positive for neuropeptidae, immunopositive, tell us that the main function uh, could be uh, control the appetite, appetite and, eating, and eating control. Uh, last uh, one, just to give you a few words of the telencephalon, the telencephalon because it's considered the start of the vertebrate brain. It started out as something very simple and small, but got bigger and bigger, particularly in birds and mammals. But you will have to wait for chapter five and six to know more about that. So how is developed? This is very interesting. Normally, the bicycle of the pallium grows outwards, as you can see here, in a process called evagination. But sometimes uh, it has been the other way around, in a process called aversion, like in the rain pine fishes. Uh, authors of the book uh, and others uh, suggest that this might be due to a lack of space to grow during development. The fact is that this makes difficult to establish homologies in the telencephalon of these animals. In tetrapod, and uh, here I show you an example of common amniotes, it has long been divided into medial pallium, hippocampus in mammals, dorsal pallium, no cortex in mammals, lateral pallium, olfactory cortex, and in ventral pallium, amygdala in mammals. But this is difficult to bring to some fish lineages, uh, and especially with the verse pallium. Why? Due to lack gene expression data and because connections are known to have changed a lot during evolution. However, what we know for sure is that the telencephaloids repeat all olfactory inputs. In lampreys and half fishes, they cover the entire pallium, but in dog fish, for example, and in teleos, is more restricted, being in teleos uh, restricted to the uh, posterior pallium. But how did they use the sense of smell? Of the sense of smell? Mainly to forage for food, following olfactory cues. However, in running water, this was not easy at great distance because it seems that they, they was in other packets. So they were looking for these other packets and shown in that direction to maximize the change in finding food. Importantly, however, they also use these olfactory signals to return to their spawn site. For me, this is very interesting, or maybe because I study memory in rodents, natostomes uh, uh, like sharks have been shown to have some kind of long-term memory, and this helped them to navigate and return to their destination using olfactory cues, but also with additional kinds of sensory information, creating new type of memory. And uh, just to, uh, before finish, I would like just to, to point this article from Cosme Salas. I find very interesting. In fact, I cannot stop reading about navigation in sharks now. How do you integrate so much information? And, and where is the dorsolateral pallium? Because in this article, when they make a lesion in the dorsolateral pallium, all golf fishes, they cannot uh, go properly to their goal. So now I cannot stop reading about this, and I'm sure it will help me better to better understand memory processing in rodents. So, without further ado, I will give the word to Manuel, and he will be um, moderating the session as usual, and Alex and me will pay attention to your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, that was very nice. Well, well done. Uh, so, I guess you will mm -hmm. have to leave now, right, because we need uh, Paul in on a stage and we need to share the screen so Len can tell us about the cerebellum. Uh, uh, also Luis left, I don't think that would, no, Luis is here. I'm here. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll invite, no, I will share the screen and while, yeah, let me just share. So can you see this? Not yet. Not yet. Got it. Got it. Yes. Should I start? Can you see it or? Uh, yes. Yes, you should start. Okay. But I cannot mute myself. Sorry. Sorry, because I cannot, uh, I need to mute myself. And I need to. 
Yeah, let me just, sorry. Because I need to invite Paul before and mute myself. Okay, so I will mute myself. Uh, you have to tell me when, when to switch uh, slide, okay? Okay, but uh, screen sharing, I don't see my slide anymore though. Oh, there it is, okay, all set. Hopefully everyone sees this. I'm really not gonna talk about Telios cerebellum or cerebellum in general, uh, and you'll see why. I'm going to pick a cere cerebellar-like structures because I think they're better suited to get at what the cerebellum is probably doing. So first of all, based on mammalian work, there are two big theories of cerebellar function. One is called the forward model and the other inverse model. So just to jump ahead, the forward model is the prevalent theory of cerebellar function. In a forward model, information, cordial discharge of an intended movement is sent to the cerebellum where it's used to predict the reafferent sensory input caused by the movement. If there's any disparity of the expected and actual sensory input, it's reduced by cerebellar computations to improve the accuracy of the motor command. In an inverse model, it's the desired trajectory that's compared with the input to the motor controller. And this is modified until the actual trajectory equals the desired trajectory and the trajectory error is zero. There are very sophisticated models uh, that use both back, both forward and inverse controllers. And uh, they work really well in theory. Uh, but the trouble is motor systems of mammals are incredibly complicated. We have motor cortex, premotor cortex, and the basal ganglia extensively connected to the cerebellum. And so to say the cerebellum does this, that, or any particular function, in my opinion, is pretty much impossible. And a second big problem is there's a vast amount known about cerebellar physiology. Uh, the properties of Purkinje cells are well understood. Uh, climbing fiber input, how they induce plasticity, very well understood. And it's very hard to connect those neuroscience physiology circuitry details with the overall, it's a forward model type theory. So I'm going to switch now to the structure I've worked on, many people have worked on. Um, so next slide, please. Next slide. Oh. oh, here we go. Good. Thank you. So this is weekly electric fish, in this case, after notice, and it's the electrosensory system. And uh, I hope to convince you soon that we can steady better light fun function. And, and in fact, we can get at the idea of a forward model and give evidence for exactly how it works in these systems. And that then casts light on how the cerebellum uh, might be working. So the slide to the left. Now, my pointer is not going to work on this at all. <laughs> so the slide to the left shows uh, two fish surrounding a prey object. And uh, you see these fields, those are the electric fields produced by this fish. At the bottom, you see, and I think it's blurred out here, uh, something called EOD in black. These fish emit electric organ discharges, that's EOD, at very high rates, anywhere from 600 to over 1000 Hertz. Uh, that's, that's, that would be in isolation, it would be nice and flat. But there are two fish uh, together and there's interference of their EOD waves to produce that beat frequency. Here it's called an AM, amplitude modulation. You also see a little prey object and a, on the upper fish, a little red dot uh, with a blue surround. That's the electric image. So what this fish has to do is detect the prey in the dark based on its electric image. And uh, we know a lot about that. The, the early behavior was in fact done to a great extent by Malcolm McIver, who's in the audience, who did stellar work on the exact motions, the speed, et cetera. And, and everything since then, by the way, is based on Nelson and McIver on, on Malcolm's work on the subject. So that's the problem for the fish detect this minute change caused by the prey uh, uh, from the background uh, that's going on, beats, et cetera, et cetera. To the right, uh, we go 
now to the sensory system and uh, you see a blow up. What, what is that little red dot, the electric image? How is it represented? You see to the uh, uh, right the picture of the brain, there's a telencephalon, as we just, as Raquel just told us, uh, the tectum, etc. On top, CCB is corpus cerebelli. Electric fish we have very large cerebelli. We don't care about the cerebellum. It's as obscure in these fish as in any other vertebrate. Oh, by the way, telencephalon, uh, fairly advanced in these fish. So we go back and we see something called the ELL. That's the electrosensory lobe. That is the target of the electrosensory afferents. We see the cerebellum extends over the electrosensory lobe. That's the key point. There's really cerebellum. It's called eminentia granularis, which are cerebellar granule cells extending over the electrosensory lobe. That'll be the key focus of the rest of my talk. There's a blow up of the electrosensory lobe. Uh, to No, that's the midbrain. Go to the left. The ELL, that's it, exactly. And you see, very sophisticated, there are four electrosensory maps of the electrosensory lobe. Okay. So the caudal cerebellum, overlying ELL, is critical for predicting spatially redundant signals and canceling them. We have the prediction motif, which is going to be key to the idea of a forward model. So next slide. Okay, this is a recent review with uh, uh, Jakob Engelman and Avner Wallach, and uh, the title is Active Sensing. So you see at the top a gymnotiform fish, and at the bottom a myriad fish. A big thing is they both are weakly electrosensory fish, very sophisticated. They have totally independently evolved this sensory system, including the cerebellar cancellation mechanism. So on the top and the bottom, you see a, a yellow stripe on the top, to the bottom, a little yellow wedge. That's the electric organ. And you see to the right, tail bend. Okay. So as these fish are swimming and doing active sensing, they're bending their tail. And of course, they're bending the dipole, the electric organ dipole, and that causes massive modulation of their electric field. It's totally blurred out, but the top <laughs> uh, electric image, there it is. We see electric image in both cases. And in fact, the electric image varies with the tail bending, right? It, it's, it gets brighter, weaker, etc. And this is very, very strong. It can reach to be over 40 microvolts. So as Malcolm and, and, and Mark Nelson showed, these fish can detect signals on the order of one microvolt the tail bending noise is vastly greater than the signal they need to detect. Uh, and they've spent a lot of time evolving mechanisms to reduce that signal. Let me do a little side jump. Some of you uh, have all gone through airports and some of you may have used the noise canceling headphones. So that works exactly, basically these fish if it's possible, fish have a patent, could have patented that mechanism. They use the same mechanism of predicting the noise and then canceling it. And I'll show you a little bit of how, they, how that works. So what's happening here is the fish has gone forward past an object of interest. It could be a prey item, as Malcolm and, 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 and Mark Nelson showed, or it could be a landmark uh, for spatial learning. And then they do a backward scan, they move backwards which means they're scanning past the object of interest. And that in this case is these little black squares. Uh, they're going towards their fovea, the very dense accumulation of electroreceptors on their head. And remember, this is identical in the independently evolved more myriad and genotiform fish. So below the little black dots, you see little blue squares, which is the response of the target cells. And the main thing to gather of that is the variability you saw in the electric image caused by tail bending has been completely eliminated. They can precisely detect, identify and detect and, and determine the location. Ah, there it is. Now they're in focus of uh, the electric image. 
the prey item, for example, or, 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 or the landmark that's scanning past. You'll notice for the gymnotiform fish, two red circles, very, that's very, very strong responses when active sensing motions have occurred. And we know exactly how that works. It's not germane to this talk, so I'll just mention it, but, but we know how that works. And so what's really going on with the scanning motions in a gymnotiform fish is cancel tail bending noise and spe have a specific network mechanism that enhances active sensing motions. Okay, so this is the predict and cancel circuitry is used by Momarid fish. It's an amazing example of convergent evolution. Okay, we still haven't reached the cerebellum, so let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Don't see it yet. Oh, here we go. Oh, very blurry. -ish. By the way, I tried to do this, uh, but I cannot do the share screen in Safari. So I did upload Chrome, uh, but every time I tried to enter <laughs> Crowdcast, it just kicked me back to Safari. So that's why we have these blurry things. In the this is a paper. This is Engelman, Wallach, and Mailer, Current Opinion Neurobiology. To see these are very beautiful slides, very high quality. So now we see to the left a gymnotiform fish, and to the right a, 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 a momyrid fish, and you see in gymnotiform fish at the top is corpus cerebelli and it folds around the granule cells just continue and forms this eminentia granularis posterior if this was a goldfish or any other non electroreceptive fish it'd be just an eminentia granularis and it would be do the same sort of function for the lateral line but that's not been carefully studied there you see egp eminentia granularis simple cerebellar granule cells they project their parallel fibers, there they are, to the molecular layer, DML, dorsal molecular layer of the ELL. And you see a little DML just below. Perhaps you could point to that DML structure. There, there it is, yeah, just, just above that. There, exactly. Now, those are the maps of the electrosensory lobe. You see the dashed lines separating the maps. That's not so important. And there's a parabola cell layer, PCL, and it's got cells that appear to be Purkinje-like. They have big apical dendrites extending into the molecular layer, um, just like Purkinje cells would, and getting parallel fiber input to their spines. So are they similar to Purkinje cells? It's complicated. For one thing, they're excitatory, not inhibitory, which occurs in other cases as well. That's variable. They do express, so Purkinje cells everywhere, express rayonin receptors, so intracellular calcium stores, and uh, inositol trisphosphate, IP3R uh, uh, membranes, that release calcium. That's all Purkinje cells. Some of the cells, the most plastic pyramidal cells, express those calcium release zones as well. Uh, but the, so in other words, we see cerebellar circuitry here. Cerebellar granule cells projecting to principal cells, uh, to their apical dendrites, spiny apical dendrites. They share some molecular biology, but they're different. Purkinje cells are inhibitory, and these parabola cells are excitatory. And we look and we see the same circuitry to some extent in the Momirid brain. But there are differences. Momirids are way smarter and more sophisticated than uh, gymnotiform fish. Every, every time a momarid fish emits an electric organ discharge, it sends a corollary discharge up to its cerebellum, to its EGP. And there's special circuitry added to its ELL to take care of that. That is magnificent work. I should just mention the people started by Kurt Bell, uh, President of Oregon, now retired, Kirsty Grant in Paris, uh, Johannes Meek, in, 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 in uh, the Netherlands, and now taken over by Nate Sattel at uh, Columbia. And it's it's very complicated, so I can't, I can't review it. But you really, you've added extra stuff to the ELL based on the corollary discharge. 
So in the more myriad, you do have a traditional forward model. You have a motor command corollary discharge. So what's the point of all this? So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is so complicated and so blurred out. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna point out to a couple of similarities across more myriad and gymnotiforms. You'll see um, noise cancellation. Uh, I think you're seeing it now and you're seeing for both independently of all this long-term depression NMDA receptors, etc. That's the basis of plasticity. So it's convergently involved in the ELL or Momaris and Donoform fish, but of course it's totally different from cerebellum. Synaptic plasticity in cerebellum has completely different set of molecular rules. You'll also see that uh, uh, something called VML and STF CAMK2 alpha, STF's short term facilitation, CAMK2 alpha is. Uh, very important second messenger. And, and that, that pathway is also converged and that's specifically involved in enhancing active sensing motions. Okay, so this is too blurry, so let's go on. Hopefully, next slide. All right, so what evidence is there for active cancellation? I'm gonna use data here from Joe Bastian uh, from Oklahoma, now retired, did beautiful work. There's fantastic work in, in more myriad fish, but it gets so complicated, I'm not going to cover it. So tail bending, it's a global electrosensory signal. As the fish bends its tail, the electric organ bends, and you get a modulation of the electric field around it. It's 40 microvolts or more, depending on how much the tail is bent far greater than the one microvolt signal that Malcolm and Mark Nelson showed these fish could detect. There's also proprioceptive input and Joe Bashan showed all that input got into the seminentia granularis. You see the response of the parabola cell to the right, um, tail bending, no response. This is an incredibly strong signal that the cell does not respond to. Now, Joe invented this trick, same trick can be done in Momirids, he was record. He found the receptive field of one particular cell, and there's an arrow in the middle panel. It says local AM, local amplitude modulation. And look, it's, it's immense. It's way stronger. It's like it's way stronger than any real signal would be. And what happens is, you see, it's a negative signal, and there's an immense reduction in response to the tail bend plus local AM. And as you go along, that response diminishes. So, well, it makes sense because it's a negative going signal. Now you remove that local response. And now you see a tremendous, in the tail bend AM, just the tail bend now, is producing an immense response at C2, where in A, A2, there was no response. That is the negative image. That strong response in C2 is meant to cancel the reduction in response seen in B2. Okay, that was the first, at this point, that was the, 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 the seminal paper by Joe and showed you can create a negative image by pairing a local input, local AM, with the global input. So, next slide. So this is Gary Marsa in my lab. And that is a filled cell, filled uh, uh, parabola cell. You see the apical dendrites covered with spines and that puny little basal dendrite feed forward input points to it. That is the only, that has the sole source of extrinsic input. The first thing I discovered as a graduate student was there is a hundred times more feedback to these cells than input from the outside world, which surprised me then and still surprises me. So in this case, the feed forward input is global electrosensory input. And uh, in B, you see, there it is, a big sine wave and a communication signal, very, very high frequency called a chirp, okay? When you record upon talk, look at the feedback input, you see it's 
the same sine wave, but with flipped sine. It's the feedback input. Imagine you add feedback input to feed forward input, you end up with zero. Okay. And you see that's the bottom. Um, normally, there's very little response to that very, very strong feed forward input, but and a very strong response to the chirp. You block the feedback, and it turns out there's a very convenient little track to be described. There's the chirp. You block the feedback, and now you see the response to the feed forward input. That's a, a there's an arrow said a block wearing off. It's lidocaine injected into a fiber bundle. But before it, for, before it wears off, you see a tremendous response to the peak of the background be beat. Right? Uh, that's right, just at the upper part of that feedback block. It's, it's responding now to the, for, to the feed forward global input, but at the same time, it stops responding to the chirp. And we know why. It's really tricky. I won't try to explain it. But this fish, this part of the cerebellum, this EGP, is simultaneously blocking the irrelevant background beat, which is a, a strong signal, to permit an important communication signal to come through, and also to permit input from prey items or, or landmarks to come through. OK, next slide. Okay, so this is a paper with Joe Bastian, uh, uh, Maurice Chacron, now McGill, and myself in Neuron some years ago. So in cerebellum, we know the teaching signal. Every Purkinje cell gets a climbing fiber input, and that is the error. It's been beautifully done for, 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 for the vestibular ocular reflex, where we know exactly where that signal comes from. But every Purkinje cell has one climbing fiber onto it. Uh, when, the climbing, when it's an error, as in the forward model, it becomes active. This, the Purkinje cell shows a huge dendritic calcium spike. Calcium enters, activates all kinds of second messengers. And the parallel fiber input strength changes accordingly. So that's known from the perspective of slice in vitro physiology, but how that connects to a cerebellar Purkinje cell in the lateral hemisphere that's connected to the prefrontal cortex is completely unknown. It's just you, you can't connect the two. We have something very, very similar. In the upper panels, you see a superficial pyramidal cell. These are the ones that are, in fact, similar to Purkinje cells. It contains the nosotrus phosphate IP3R and randine receptors, intracellular calcium stores, but completely unlike Purkinje, so that's like Purkinje cell, completely unlike Purkinje cells, it expresses a very high density of NR2B, the NMDA receptor 2B subunit, and that's essential for the plasticity. Below is the teacher. That's a deep parabola cell. It lacks uh, uh, it lacks the second messenger systems. And I'm not going to go through it. In the top, you see that same cancellation strategy. You pair a global signal with a local signal, and then you show that the local signal now produces a negative image. You're, you, that cell is learning to cancel the global signal caused by tail bending. And it doesn't matter if it's a stronger or weaker signal, if it's, it's a cancellation mechanism. That's the feed forward that's the, the, the feedback cancellation. Uh, that is really the forward model in action. The bottom says, the bottom panel says, these deep cells don't do it. They're the teacher. So we have the same principle as a teacher, but the teacher does not work via climbing fibers in this case. Um, but I must again emphasize those apical dendrites, a superficial parabola cells look just like Purkinje cell dendrites, with spines, the whole bit. Etc. Okay, so next slide. Here we go. So now we're in slice physiology. Uh, this is Eric Harvey Girard in my lab. And uh, you now you do the same pairing protocol. You said, okay, we got the pairing protocol we need 
in vivo, let's apply it in slice. And you just see the LTD you produce. You see at the bottom over 50 milliseconds, you pair the parallel fiber input with action potentials generated by intracellular current. And if the pairing occurs plus or minus 50 milliseconds, you get tremendous synaptic depression, basically. Um, and it turns out it works extremely well for low frequency signals, the ones caused by tail bending. It's great for under about 15 hertz. Okay? That's tail bending noise. When you get to higher frequency signals, it doesn't work anymore. That's what allows the chirp to come through. Okay, and uh, uh, it also we can you, we showed experimentally you can cancel a nine hertz signal, but two hertz comes through. You can cancel a two hertz tail bending signal, but the nine hertz comes through. It's frequency selective, and the right panel is the model, and the model is very simple. We just took a really simple parabola cell model, a leaky integrating fire with some extra goodies on it, and gave it the synaptic learning rules. And lo and behold, it did exactly what we saw in vivo. So we literally stuck into the mo a reasonable model of a ELA pyramidal cell. We stuck in the learning rules we'd found in slice physiology, and we generated the cancellation that we know occurs in vivo. It worked perfectly. Okay, so that's good. We actually understand how cancellation works in this system. Uh, so in other words, we've got the forward model working. I should tell you that they've got models for the Momirid. They're way more sophisticated because Momirids have correlated discharge. They're beautiful models. Nate Sautel collaborated with a great theoretical neuroscientist, Larry Abbott, uh, to generate those models. And they're, they're, they're super, but I, I, just, I cannot, they're too complicated. So next slide. So this is amazing uh, and very critical. The dorsal cochlear nucleus of mammals is a cerebellar-like structure. And you see, I, the paper is so complicated, the paper from Nate Sautel, a cerebellum-like circuit in the auditory system cancels response to self-generated sounds. Um, so there it is. Birds, reptiles don't have a DCN. This just appears out of nowhere in mammals. It's the, a fellow called Thanos Sinopoulos, University of Pittsburgh, did the work in the left panel. And uh, in fact, the person who first analyzed the DCN in detail was one of my collaborators, Enrico Mugnaini, just retired from Northwestern University. And you see the circuitry. You've got, that's the upper left, you've got a cluster of granule cells producing parallel fibers. Uh, you got the auditory nerve ending on a fusiform cell which is like a parabola cell in ELL. They look identical. That's fusiform. To the left is uh, uh, a cartwheel cell, which is a Purkinje cell. Okay. And he, uh, uh, Thanos worked out in detail the physio There's a lot of synaptic depression. There are definite similarities with what happens to the electrosensory lobe, what I just described to you. It's very different from what happens in Purkinje cells, but finally, so, but you still get the same thing. There's some kind of feed forward corollary discharge when, and also sensory input and proprioceptive input, when a mouse is chewing. And Nate uh, played, played those sounds to me once. Yeah, it's very loud to, to a mouse chewing on something hard. These are very loud sounds and the mouse would be totally deafened if that was, that's what I would hear, these very loud chewing sounds. So it couldn't hear a cat sneaking up on it. And so those self-generated chewing sounds are completely canceled by the circuitry. And uh, uh, at some point they say, uh, uh, an adaptive filter for canceling self-generated sounds. Adaptive filtering is established previously in cerebellum-like sensory structures in fish, suggested conserved function for the structures across vertebrates. Okay, and they use the word conserved. Um, so this was amazing, it's wonderful, wonderful work. So next slide goes back to the more generic thing. 
That's the final summary slide. Okay. So you see up on top, is there a conserved regulatory gene regulatory network? So of course, <laughs> I'm not a microbiologist. Uh, uh, that comes from work by uh, a book called uh, uh, Homology by Gunther Wagner. But there's, it's been, it, this has been hypothesized before. And the idea is that there's a conserved gene regulatory network it's been found associated with uh, 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 the pectoral fins. The pectoral fins of fish are generated, hypothesized as evidence for it, by a conserved regulatory gene network that then produces the four limbs of us, our arms, basically. Okay? So when it comes to limb development, uh, uh, let's see, the sea urchin gut, etc you can define gene regulatory networks to a large extent. When it gets to the brain, I don't believe it's ever been done. So you have the cerebellum of mammals. It's got granule cells, parallel fibers. We've seen that covered. They contact the spiny dendrites of inhibitory Purkinje cells. There's very complicated plasticity dynamics. Uh, um, and plus that, uh, there's climbing fibers. Okay? And Purkinje cells in contact deep distant nuclear neurons. You look at fish cerebellum, it has granule cells and Purkinje cells, and they're very similar, IP3R and Randian receptors, et cetera, et cetera. Climbing fiber input. The difference is, instead of deep nuclear neurons, there are these urodendroid cells that have apical dendrites that also get parallel fiber input. Okay, so you say yes, cerebellum, of, 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 of mammals uh, or amniotes and fish are very similar. So what about cerebellar-like structures? The lateral line region of all vertebrates have, it's similar. The parallel fibers cancel for like or, or reach kidney like cells, uh, et cetera. In elasmobranchs, they may contact excitatory cells. There's plasticity, but there's not no detail. So there's, but it's that classic parallel fiber, pyramidal Purkinje cell type connection with plasticity. There's a recent paper from Perks and Bosnick shows cancellation in the lateral line system as well. So that's very similar. Electrosensory lobe, that's what I covered. It's the same parallel fiber contacting a projection cell. Now the projection cell is excitatory, but there's similarities and differences in the plasticity mechanisms. This is a weird thing now, optic tectum. We saw in Raquel's talk uh, she showed, I almost interrupted, but I thought I'd let her go on. You saw the cerebellum, and then it extended forward to the valvular cerebelli. And finally, a little bump at the end, and it was actually labeled as a TOL, torus longitudinalis, and it seemed to be granule cells in it. Yes, that's a, that's a huge, huge, a huge spherical agglomeration of densely packed cerebellar granule cells. And they project to the outer layer of the teleos tectum, except it's called strata marginale, and they contact projection neurons, transmitter unknown, expressing IP3R and radian receptors. So those look like Purkinje cells. Uh, no one knows anything of, 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 of what they do. And in DCL, there's a structure that, that uh, was first described by Enrico Mainaini and then studied in detail by Nate Sautel what has the same circuitry. So optic tectum is midbrain. There's <laughs> DCN is is auditory medulla. None of that should happen. So the question is, is this just convergent evolution? The same core structures, etc. So my suspicion is this conserved GRN that has the information developing a core cerebellar like structure. It can be turned on in all kinds of places. It can be turned on the tectum of teleos fish, in the auditory hindbrain of a mammal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so they're all homologous with respect to this particular GRN. Beyond that, they're all different, uh, and it's no longer. So in other words, you're convergent. I'm sorry, it's homology with respect to the core GRN, but not homologous with respect to 
transmitters, plasticity, et cetera, et cetera. That's all convergent evolution. And what we see in these accessory structures, DECN, et cetera, is a forward model. In electric fish, it's pretty, it's a global input, chewing, uh, 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 tail bending, predicts a sensory input. That's the forward model. Uh, it could even be a corollary discharge from a wired fish. In this case, the prediction is used to cancel off that sensory input to let important acoustic input from cats sneaking up on you or prey come through. So that's, that's it. Thank you. And I hope that was clear, despite the blurriness of the slides. Thank you, Len. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so I, I couldn't see whether there was there were questions because I, I was sharing. There are a couple of questions. I don't know if uh, uh, Luis, Paul, or Idoya want to add or comment or ask something. Otherwise, we will move to the questions. I actually uh, posted a question. I actually uh, you just ask it and posted a question. I was just curious uh, about uh, the inferior olive uh, and where, uh, more, actually more generally, I was asking about the ELL, but um, where among all these various cerebellum-like structures do you see something that looks like an inferior olive? Uh, is that a common thing or is that really special to the cerebellum? totally special to the cerebellum. So the cerebellum of fish, there's an inferior olive, climbing fibers, it's all the same. Uh, none of those other structures have climbing fiber input. We're the only ones who showed where the teaching signal comes from. Those are the deep cells that hasn't been done in any other, other fish. Mm -hmm. So there is a teaching signal, I believe. It's just different from the inferior olivary teaching signal. So That's nothing like that in the DCN either, right? Hmm? What? Nothing, nothing like an inferior olive for the DCN. No, so yeah. absolutely not. Okay. And Rico showed that. Okay. Um, and and I would like to ask uh, when you mention when you conclude that all these examples having some similarities, functional similarities and nevertheless occupy different positions in the brain and therefore you say they are convergent with this is another way of saying that they they are analog the cases of functional analogy or not because you are yes. you, you, yeah, so, you, you so, compare with homology so, so but i i would say that if it's convergent then it should be you should compare with analogy because that's what for me is an analogy when you obtain a similar function mm -hmm. uh, coming from a different background, different developmental or anatomical mm -hmm. background, and then the similarities are just accidental. The similarities are mm -hmm. so that's completely possible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, completely possible. I would predict, my prediction would be that you would find in, for example, the DCN cartwheel cells or the parabola cell elections or, or the, the, the ability to accept parallel fiber input, you would find similar gene networks in all the target structures of cerebellar parallel fibers. That, and you say that's, that set of genes receiving parallel fiber input, et cetera, et cetera, that is the GRN. Everything else is independent, but that's never been shown. That's just an hypothesis that the parallel fiber projections to spiny apical dendrites, that there's a gene network that produces that, but everything else is analogy, convergent evolution. But there is no proof either way, because when you get to the brain, trying to find GRNs is nearly impossible, has not been done, except maybe in the case of dopamine producing cells. But Can I, I quickly I ask for the, the gene funds, what is that GNR or who are the members? Uh, do you remember any famous genes that are there? Well, maybe, yeah, maybe thrombic lip related genes, maybe, because that's a, a feature that exists throughout the hindbrain so that multiple mm -hmm. places along the rhombic lip could have a background of common genomic background. So that would be sure. possible if you, because 
Parkman granular cells, they are rhombic lip uh, derived entities. And maybe the parallel element the granular cells in the cochlear nuclei are the same. And maybe you get some other lateral line, lateral line organ that also inherits some action from rhombic lip gene, uh, gene background. So that could be a unifying, go back unifying deep homology level, no? That you are deriving things from, from the rhombic lip. But I should go back to uh, uh, Lamprey and uh, uh, two books by Olaf Larsell. <laughs> I suspect many people here weren't born it was in the 60s. The second volume was on the cerebellum of different mammals. And the first one was called the cerebellum from myxinoids to birds. <laughs> and he starts with the Lamprey. And he says, well, fish, shark, they all have a cerebellum. It looks like the same old cerebellum. Here's some, some variation, all hand-drawn, beautiful, but he says, in, now remember, this is pre-experimental. He says, look at the lamprey and its hindbrain. There is no obvious cerebellum. We see a nerve coming into the dorsal medulla, and I believe it's a lateral line nerve, and it probably is. He's, he's a very good anatomist. And it comes into an area that has these crest cells, and, and there's some granule-like cells and perhaps some parallel fibers. And he says, he hypothesizes that in the lamprey you see the emergence of a cerebellum and it's emerging from lateral line nucleus and it has the beginnings of cerebellar like structure you have little little cells he thinks are granule cells uh, what he thinks are is parallel fibers and cells with apical dendrites and i was going to and i forgot i was going to just uh, uh, copy <laughs> those images from olaf larsell so if you can find the book, I have, I have it somewhere. It's called The Cerebellum from Myxinoids to Birds. And his first little chapter is on lamprey. And so his hypothesis is very clear. The cerebellum evolved from a lateral line structure. He did nothing but cancellation, nothing but anything, except the lateral line nerves seem to end in the deep part of the structure. Uh, and the principal cells had apical dendrites that he thought received parallel fiber input. I personally believe that Olaf Larsell was correct. That's that's how the cerebellum began. I have zero evidence for this. In other words, if a molecular biologist were to work on the lamprey, they could find the GRN <laughs> and then they'd see it in everything, all the structures I just talked about, including the cerebellum. I have zero evidence from this point of view. It's just that he was, he was, yeah, he just convinced me. Uh, Olaf Larsell convinced me. I never met him, by the way. So that's something to look up. Olaf Larsell, his first volume, the first section on lampreys and that around. Okay, so we had uh, Malcolm who wanted to make a question, if you want. Hey, Malcolm. Hey, Your microphone is off. Yeah, maybe I can unmute you. I oh, know it doesn't work for some reason. <laughs> you move your mouse to the upper border of your of your screen. Did you see how to how you can open your microphone? Yeah. No, I, I'm actually trying to unmute him and and I cannot for some reason. So I will invite you again. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Lynn, so good to see you. Uh, so I have a vague uh, question for you, which I think you've already answered by basically saying we don't really understand the cerebellum. Um, but I nonetheless wanted to meditate on whether the portfolio of errors uh, changed, the errors that needed to be corrected by the brain changed substantially when you get out of water and what that really means. Um, and I guess, um, you know, obvious things like the effect of the gra of gravity on the body are quite different, right? Ab above water, like control signals to abduct my arm when I'm vertical are extremely different than if I'm lying on the ground and do the same motion. And so therefore errors attendant to that command are going to be different. So there's that. There's just a whole lot of things. But, you know, 
I just wonder what you think about, okay, so there's this homology point you, you made about uh, error correction and, and that's central GRN uh, that, that seems to, at least in the original form, be about canceling the effect of of motor action on sensory input, but what what is the job portfolio? How is it expanded, or is it just a, a separate thing that the cerebellum is doing, even in even in aquatic animals? <laughs> so that's my terrible vague question. So the one part of a man's cerebellum that we can address that is called the vestibular cerebellum, uh, the flocculus. Mm. It is the most primitive, ancient part uh, in humans. It's barely noticeable uh, and it, it directly connects to the vestibular apparatus. So you imagine the VOR, vestibular ocular reflex. So I turn my head to the right and my eyes compensate and I maintain focus on something on the screen. Uh, it's, it's beautifully developed. You can study it in rabbits. It's very good to study it in rabbits. So how, how does, so, so now what you can do is you can put prism goggles on someone. <laughs> so now as I turn my head, here, the image can move much faster or much slower mm -hmm. across my retina. And the VOR doesn't work anymore. And a long time ago, you used to see undergraduates walking around campus with goggles on, prism goggles, bumping into things. They were paid for this course. And after a while, they compensate, they adapt. And they get rid of this, the extra slip. That's all done in the flocculus. The air signal is transmitted from the retina, from motion sensing cells, via a pretectal nucleus, and this is birds and mammals, and goes as climbing fibers to the flocculus, and that's the air signal. So it's really, really, really similar. Okay? Mm -hmm. When you get out of the flocculus, whether you're a fish or a land vertebrate, you're done, that's it. <laughs> Most of the human cerebellum are the hemispheres and they connect the cortex, uh, often prefrontal. So what is the air signal there? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> it's gigantic in whales. So you, don't, you can be in water and still need some kind of correction. Yeah. But this is at such a high level that I don't believe, no one has a clue, I don't have a clue, right? And so the air signals, whether you're in water or in air, whether you're a dolphin or us swinging on a tree or walking on the ground or a crocodile, or whatever you are, you're screwed when you're on, on land it's or, or water. You don't know what you're trying to correct for, et cetera, what the air signal is, right? And so the only good work is on prism goggles and the VOR and the <laughs> flocculus. So that's my answer, I don't know. Okay, good, fair. Okay, so yeah. I think we don't have more questions and, and we actually want to hear from Idoya. Uh, so if you want to share your screen, Idoya, uh, we can listen to your talk. Sure. Yeah. Right, you should be yeah, seeing my to, screen. To go into uh, presentation yeah. mode. Uh, yeah. Here you go. Here you go. It's okay. You see it? It's yes. okay. You see Great. it? Go ahead. Great. Great. Fantastic. So um, I will start right away. Well, of course, thank you very much for the organizing for inviting me to, to these talks, which I, I've been following and I find amazing. Uh, first of all, a bit of expectations on this talk, who I am and what's my background. So I'm a developmental neuroscientist trying to understand evolution. Um, my background is mainly neuroanatomical and molecular. So this is to say that I'm not an expert on computational neuroscience or behavior, but I believe that those fields and my fields have so much to fit to each other, and that's why I'm also following this with great interest. And very happy to participate today. Um, but today, what I want to tell you about is a bit. Oh, let's see how to control this. Yeah, here you go. 
is a bit about the brain of sharks and what can shark tell us about the evolution of the telencephalon in particular. So let's see if I can control this properly. Here you go. Right, so at a glance, uh, when we look at the brain of sharks or cartilaginous fishes in general, uh, there are two structures that are very evident and that probably catch our attention as novelties, right, like with respect to previous forms that we know of brains, such as lampreys or even invertebrates. And these are obviously the cerebellum and the big telencephalon. Let's say uh, we know the cerebellum itself, it's uh, as we've been talking. Uh, until now, might be an innovation that emerged greatly during uh, early natostomes with uh, jawed vertebrates. And the telencephalon, it was there before, even though it's not a novelty of, of um, jawed vertebrates, but it's greatly enlarged and complexified in this lineage. Um, and today I wanted to talk about these two aspects of the telencephalon in in cartilaginous fresh, so their great expansion and their complexification, and maybe debate with you whether this is ancestral or not, and what can sharks, studying sharks and other cartilaginous fish, can um, do for us to learn a bit more about how this um, expansion and compl complexification, if that is even a word in English, uh, about the telencephalon and how this happened. Right. First of all, super brief introduction of what is the telencephalon, where it comes from. Uh, so embryologically, it comes from the anteriormost uh, part of the neural tube, which is the prosencephalon. It in part uh, derives exactly from the alar plate of one sort of the hypothalamus. Um, in humans, for example, or in uh, mam mammals, and certain complex mammals give rise to the cerebral cortex and the basal ganglia. Uh, however, it's present in all uh, vertebrates we know so far in very different shapes and sizes. And it's actually, we could argue, is one of the structures that has suffered the heaviest um, or more drastic modifications throughout vertebrate history. It's so different that, uh, in particular, its dorsal part, the pallium, sometimes is very difficult to homologize across the species, especially in their adult forms. Uh, but if we look at the developmental stages, these uh, things get a bit easier uh, to compare across vertebrates. As usual, development is more conserved, so we can uh, compare things easier. As a general rule, um, the telencephalon has a dorsal part, also called pallium, that produces glutamatergic excitatory neurons, and a ventral part, or also called subpallium, that produces GABAergic or inhibitory neurons. And this is very conserved across vertebrates. And also the interneurons, the GABAergic neurons generated in this ventral part migrate dorsally and integrate in, in the pallium, which will create a circuit, right? And excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the adult pallium or dorsal telencephalon. Um, why I believe sharks are good models to study the evolution of the telencephalon? Well, first of all, there is a huge variability as uh, Raquel very well introduced. But in particular, sharks, many sharks, have big evaginated telencephalons. And this makes their general anatomy more comparable with other telencephalons, such as those of amphibians or lobed fin fishes, or even uh, mammals, um, than other maybe vertebrates with less um, conserved near anatomy. That's one thing. They are also considered slow evolvers. Um, meaning that uh, there are studies demonstrating that they have slower rates of molecular evolution. This means that the sharks and cartilaginous fishes in general, they may have retained certain features uh, that has been lost or heavily modified in other species, right? So it could be a good um, living fossil, as, as some of them would be. Um, of course, this is true for some structures, not for others, but it helps also to um, let's say, um, um, interpret evolution, that things are morphologically conserved. Um, so an example of such conservation is the way they develop their telencephalons. This has been also nicely introduced by Raquel. So sharks, as well as all other tetrapods, they develop their telencephalus by a process 
called evagination, and this contrasts with the way uh, teleosts develop their telencephalus, which is by aversion, which is this weird for <laughs> as morphogenetic process. So as usual, with all the things, teleosts went really weird in their development of their palings of the dorsal parts in particular. Um, but yeah, this is an, an example of why uh, sharks conserve some, some features that might be useful for comparison purposes. They also, um, many species of them, not all, but many species of sharks lay eggs that are transparent. And this is the species that we studied that I will be referring in most of my talk, Silorinus canicula is a galeomorph shark. And it's particularly good model because as you see, they, have, they lay eggs, they are transparent, we can see them. And this development is very, very slow. We are talking about months of development. So what happens in uh, teleosts or several fish happens in 48 hours. It happens in sharks in maybe six months. And this depends on what species like. So there is really a slow development, which can be a drawback in some senses uh, to develop some tools, let's say. However, it can be also very nice to uh, not to miss any detail of development. So I think um, in our model, we really see details that might be overlooked in other species. Um, right, this is to show that they also can be uh, survive and thrive outside their egg cases, which can be very convenient for environmental manipulation. Um, so going to the point, what do we know about shark telencephalon? So at this moment, so a bit of embryonic development. Um, we have characterized with transcription factors that are very conserved uh, that they do have a pallium and subpallium, not surprising. The pallium, the subpallium is formed by a prospective pallidum, let's say, an NKX 2.1 positive region, and then a prospective striatum, so it has the two ingredients of the subpallium. And the pa there is evidence for a tetraparted pallium as well with ventral, lateral, dorsal, and medial parts. Um, we have uh, also characterized very clear trans uh, tangential migratory routes of gabaragic origin. So uh, this goes from the subpallium to the pallium in a very similar way as in mammals. Um, and it ends in what we have characterized as also the dorsal pallium, which also expresses reeling, which is very interesting because this is supposed to produce lamination. And even though sharks don't have a laminated dorsal pallium, they have reeling there at this moment. Uh, we also characterize some roots, to pallia roots that are, doesn't seem to be conserved. Of course, there are some divergence, um, like the one from the medial uh, ganglionic eminence, like towards the septum or what could, could be the medial pali. And uh, yeah, um, and very briefly on this story as well, I don't in the interest of time, we have also observed that there is a conserved program of differentiation of pallial neurons who follow the same sequence of transcription factor expression seen in other vertebrates. That would be these three genes in sequence uh, produce the glutamatergic neurons of the pallium like in other species. Uh, what is slightly different from other basal vertebrates is that the intermediate state of this um, progression, so the cells that are expressing this gene here, some of them seems to be proliferative. So we are at the moment characterizing this population. Why is this important? Well, um, this, this neural progenitors, this different type of progenitors that are away from the ventricular zone, um, with this feature, so expressing this gene and located here, are well known in mammals as intermediate progenitors, and they are the ones who were thought to might have triggered expansion of the pallium in mammals in particular. In, of course, in mammals and in uh, other lineage of primates, they have diversified and they are in many more numbers. But this similarity raises the questions of whether the early natostomes might already have a blueprint of this process, so a blueprint of indirect neurogenesis is what it's called. Or is this convergent evolution? Are this a cell type that is, happens to be just very similar and be in the same position? These are uh, current questions that I'm asking in my current uh, project in EMBL. And um, whether these and other cell types might be actually homologous or this might be convergent evolution. <clears throat> so we are trying to do some single cell RNA 
and, and analyzing kinds of questions. So, so if it's possible uh, that the first big expansion and its mechanisms of neurogenesis, as we saw, might have appeared before the splits of sharks and the rest of mammals, it is this classic right? Um, or did telencephalic expansions happen individually? Um, so let's say developmental conservation, in my opinion, argues for the first option. However, uh, I think the position of the book and, and also fossil evidence argues for the second one, meaning fossil evidence shows that endocasts of um, vertebrates, precursors around these ages of origin of, of job species have actually surprisingly small telencephalons, or at least the volumes of them are small. We can discuss this as well, um, but this argues for the second option. And these are questions that I'm already trying to tackle, as I say, by studying cell type evolution with uh, more molecular approaches, and they are very open still for discussion, of course. Um, and we hope that sharks can give us a clue on, on this type of questions, and when these things happen. And uh, what do we know about the adult brain anatomy? We'll also be try to be brief and concise. Um, um, again, supallium, I don't think I've mentioned this. So supallium is generally more conserved. This is um, common across the vertebrate scale, right? And here is also the case. So supallium is more clear, more, more easily homologized. In the case of uh, cartilaginous fishes, all having the supallium, this nuclei here is called ASV or area superficialis basalis. Seems like a layer or a, a disposition of neurons um, that uh, has um, characteristics of both a pallidum and an istriatum. So it looks more like the medial part of it is a pallidum and it derives from the region that expresses NKX, and the lateral part of it is more an striatum, at least molecularly. What it was called classically striatum of Smith, thanks to our molecular evidence, uh, we believe it's a ventral pallium, actually. And uh, we also have some evidence, so we've traced this part of what we suspect is the striatum, broadly traced it, but we actually detected uh, substantial nigra um, uh, neurons projecting to this part and also posterior tuberculum ventral tegmental area. So it makes sense that there is um, basal ganglia circuitry, knowing that in, in lamprey this basal, basal ganglia circuitry is very developed, it's not even surprising that it's there. So this is about the subpallium. What about the pallium? Um, the pallium, as I said, is always more complicated. Um, one thing to say about the pallium of chondrictions is that it's very heterogeneous neurochemically, it has catecholaminergic abundant cells, peptidergic, somatostatin, some things that are not so commonly seen in other vertebrates, and in that way this seems to be a, um, maybe a particular chondrictin or elasmobranch thing. Uh, but otherwise, we have some evidence for a pallial amygdala, as I show here, this is the recent work from Isabel Rodriguez Moldes. Um, et al. and it looks like a pallial amygdala could be here, that's compatible. Um, next. And uh, pretty much there is a description of nuclei. As far as I know, there is not much consensus of what the homologies with other vertebrates are. Um, but uh, let's say this is a forum where we like to speculate, right, and give ideas. So I'm going to give you uh, my opinion on the shark pallium here. There is this nuclei that is, uh, let's say not nuclear, this band of dense cells called the APP and um, that it's uh, located here in the middle that we've seen that during development it produces GABAergic and uh, sorry, it, GABAergic neurons arrive here by migrations and then they integrate in this region here with glutamatergic. So in that sense, a mix of glutamatergic origin that could be um, supported as a potential dorsal pallium homologous, let's say cortical homologous. And the mid part of it, uh, which is uh, probably composed by the same type of neurons, could be uh, an hippocampus. But as we know, as I said, this is a 
one of my guesses, if I had to guess, we need many more molecular um, data that hopefully will be produced soon uh, to, to really know who these guys are. Because uh, as you go more caudally with, uh, within the palium of sharks, so we are at the moment at this level here, if you go here, there are some other nucleus that seem to be more divergent that are called actually medial palium in other species. So uh, this is a still a black box, let's say, that this is what I would bet on if somebody asked me where is the cortex and hippocampal homologous of sharks. And uh, finally, I would like to touch something that is mentioned in the book, just uh, my uh, humble uh, words on this which is the fact that the, the olfaction trend of the palm, which I find really interesting, and whether this is the ancestral condition or not. So here I've shown um, the telencephalon of Silorinus canicula, so the same gallimorph shark that I've been showing, and the telencephalon of a raya, raya which is a skate. Uh, here is the squalus acanthi, which is another group of, of um, cartilaginous, the squalomorphous. And you can see us how many parts of this telencephalon don't receive directly uh, olfactory inputs, right? What they have called in the squalus dorsal pallium and medial pallium, they don't have many inputs from the olfaction. So is this trend, this happened already before the splits of sharks and other vertebrates, or it happened in, independently? So the book again, and the chapter seems to go for the second option, that this is uh, again convergent evolution. Um, I would like to to brought this to discussion as well. Is this ancestral or not? Um, the thing is, modern sharks display very complex behaviors. You same for rays. Many of them, those are actually attributed to telencephalic functions, and this has been shown with um, very few, but they exist some lesion lesion experiments um, of the of the telencephalon of the medial pallium, where where uh, sharks lose the ability to locate uh, and remember locations. Um, and we also know that the both big parts of the palms to non-olfactory processing. So um, the telencephalon itself might have originated as an olfactory processing center, but it slowly acquired other functions. So this origin of the telencephalon might have been really uh, before uh, sharks and maybe even before vertebrates. And, but, it slowly acquired other functions. So it makes actually sense that this acquiring of new functions happened actually at early natostom, when early natostoms started to become more efficient long distance predators, for example, and starting to use this new space, let's say, created in the pallium to receive other sensory inputs to create new types of memories and uh, also to create associative memories and so on, leading to great complexification of the pallium. And of course, this is all speculation and throwing to the air some questions, but um, it's possible that they had already started to use their telencephalons as high order information processing centers. Uh, again, the position of the book seems to be that early natostoms use their, use their telencephalons to compare and contrast current olfactory cues with remembered ones, I think, but it, they're still attributed to be quite olfactory in nature. And then they say that other senses might also be processed by other brain centers like the midbrain. So uh, we need more data on sharks, that's a fact. Uh, so a better understanding of the shark brain and its homologies, try to do this from maybe more molecular way and have definitely more behavioral and connectomic data uh, might help to answer these and other questions about how our telencephalons actually evolve. And with this, I think it's all on my side. Thank you very much for listening and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daya. That was great. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing and, and maybe please ask, ask your questions if you have a, in the ask a question button. Uh, in the meantime, if any of the panelists uh, want to, yeah, both want to make a Yeah, I, I actually yeah, have ahead. a question yeah, I'd I, like I, to sort of invite you to speculate about. Um, something that the book um, makes quite strongly is the point that 
projections out of the telencephalon are kind of a convergent feature of many different lineages. And, and for example, what we see in mammals is kind of an unusual uh, projection from dorsal pallium to motor structures, etc. Similar things appeared in birds, but it's not a general ancestral state of vertebrates um, in general. And, and so, but in light of that, um, the work of Grillner shows very clearly these, these projections out of the telencephalon from the lateral pallium. Well, it, it, it's, it's hard to say exactly which part, um, but, but something that might be dorsal, actually dorsal pallium, um, projecting downstream, um, as well as uh, work of, um, <clears throat> of many groups um, in other species, including Northcutt himself in, in reptiles and uh, Ebison and Schroeder in sharks. Um, so I'm wondering where do you stand on this issue? Is, is this something that just appears a lot among vertebrates and, and the projections in sharks are something that appeared in sharks? Um, or is this really kind of a, a standard um, feature that in some cases regresses. So it's lost, let's say, in amphibians and maybe some others. Um, you know, is this sort of um, the projections out of the pallium, out of the telencephalon, um, you know, where do you stand on that anatomically among the various uh, cartilaginous fish? Right. Uh, yeah, I think it's really complicated. Um, to be honest, I always tend to to think about conservation same way as um, I tend to go the other way as the book goes. So I really don't know. That's the short answer. But uh, I've seen many characters, um, not only the descending projections from the cortex, that uh, they are constantly seen in sharks or cartilaginous fish all across different ones and other uh, vertebrates but secondarily lost in let's say amphibians or birds that might be more uh, divergent on that so my question is i don't know i tend to think that it's an ancestral condition and it's common among lost. the it's common among the various cartilaginous fish branches like skates and holocephalans and all that direct uh, connection from yeah. the pallium that i don't know i have to say maybe someone in the in the audience can answer that i'm not completely sure if it's a uh, very shared across you know it's a different kinds of galliomorphs okay. all right thanks Would you like to uh, comment uh, anything else? Well, actually, I, I, left, I would, left. if nobody else has asked the question. Um, you, you described the, the, um, kind of like a, a disagreement between a conservation developmentally and a convergence in terms of um, the size from the fossil evidence. But aren't, aren't those things really not incompatible? I mean, the topology developmentally gets set up, perhaps ancestrally. It just doesn't get very big, except in, in a couple of uh, lineages where it gets big because it happens to be useful to now invest a lot more in that particular thing, like, like reef living sharks might really need a big telencephalon, uh, whereas others just don't. And so the topology, in other words, is actually conserved and the function, perhaps, as well, it just doesn't sort of earn all the oxygen that for for many species and so it just so in the fossils we see uh independent enlargement yeah i completely agree with that also fossils are of course uh, very few so you, we have them very spread it might happen that we got the bad the wrong one uh however yeah i think it's very possible that this process already started there. It just didn't grow so much until later ages 
uh, individually. Uh, what I am particularly interested in is in this cell type evolution, right? So I'm, I'm really interested in to know whether we can compare this cell type as uh, with, with a mammal one to see if these progenitors molecularly were already there and what can that tell us about the evolution of uh, these types of new neurogenesis and how conserved is that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not completely, uh, absolutely, it's not one or the other. There might be an explanation that meets in the middle. Uh, also, uh, endocasts just tell us that the volume, right? So it's a relative volume. It can uh, be accurate or not. Let's see, I don't know. And also you don't see the size of the ventricles in, in endocasts. You don't see um, how tight the whole thing is inside, how many neurons are actually there. So it's, of course, it's not completely incompatible. It's just something to think about and consider, of course. But it's interesting because the, the, the picture you paint about the telencephalon, um, you know, the, the pallium, subpallium being very conserved, the migration of the intermittary neurons being conserved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's quite different than what Len uh, described about the cerebellum, where where you know you get excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and 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 really a a, a great variety of um, you know structures that seem to do similar things, and yet use different neuron types and, and develop in different parts of the neural tube, and and so on, and and so it actually looks like the cerebellum is much more variable across vertebrates than the telencephalon. Yeah, absolutely. The truth is as well that I'm focusing on the common, right? So there is a part of this um, pallium that really looks like a part of the, the pallium of, of mouse. But of course, there are other divergence within the pallium that I've seen. And the truth is, the embryo looks really, really similar as it develops a bit. Like if, if I show you an embryo that is slightly older than that one, you will see that things start to diverge from what we know in, in mama. So in my research in particular, I use commonalities. I used to, to try to see what was the ancestral condition. But of course, there is also divergence in uh, the palings themselves. And as I said, there are some black boxes, some nucleus that uh, have, we have no idea what they are. They're probably big parts of the palin that are not, don't have any counterpart in, in non-cartilaginous fish. And who knows where the connections are. Uh, this is still... Do um, you see anything like an amygdala? Yes, so I, I mentioned oh, yeah? uh, embryonically, there is a, there is a clear region in, in the lateral uh, ASV that uh, Isabel Rodriguez Moldes has proposed as the pallial amygdala, and it makes a lot of sense. It also receives some olfactory uh, inputs. Um, it, it lays exactly in the region where the prosumeric model would predict the ventral pallium, uh -huh. and, uh, and the position doesn't change that much. There's not much nuclear migration in this species, so you can actually see it in, in juveniles and adults. So that's a... Uh, a big candidate for it. There is also studies of behavior, I think, also I'm not an expert on that, with fear conditioning with sharks that oh. show that if you are actually ablate pallium and these parts of the lateral pallium that could be amygdala, that get lost. Um, Who was doing that? So this was done very long time ago, I think from a few years ago. I haven't seen new ones, uh, but the main author used to be Vera Schlussel. I uh, can send you the, the link. So she has done a lot of behavior experiments in sharks and rays. Um, they have done kind of, uh, let's say, more rudimentary lesions than in other animals. Of course, it's more difficult. And also running behavioral tests on sharks is not an easy task. Uh, but yes, she, she has some pioneer work on that, um, showing that this uh, level, high level uh, conditioning circuits might actually lay on in the pallium itself. So, okay. Very nice, thanks. Yes, I can share that. Yeah. May I ask something? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like to point out a general uh, issue that I think uh, complicates understand the comparative understanding of uh, telencephalic, particularly pallial parts. And that is the, the we have been working for, for several dozen years on the idea that you do cross sections of the telencephalon 
and whatever is ventral is called ventral, whatever looks dorsal is dorsal, whatever is lateral is lateral. But you have, for instance, here in the in cross sections of the of the shark brain, we can see that the olfactory bulb occupies a rather lateral position. So if your pallium shows the olfactory bulb in a lateral position, how do you compare this pallium uh, with which sort of sections? you want to compare with the mouse or factory bulb and, and, and nearby pallium. So everybody just thinks that just everybody continues doing cross-section and comparing naively cross-sections just by topography. And I, 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 I'm completely sure from the developmental point of view, looking at, at clonal results, which we have for some, several fishes, and also with the labeling of radial glia and so on, that you simply have to know what is first before starting your study of pallium, you have to look at what is the radial organization. And once you know where is the, for this type area of the ventricle, where is my pile surface? Because nobody tells you in the books where is the pile surface for any part of the ventricle. You just assume that if you go in your series of cross section, you are going from rosa to coda, and that may be false. And, and yeah. you assume that you're going from lateral to medial, and it's also false. It's not, mm -hmm. not topologically comparable to other species. So yeah. fishes pose a particular problem because they have different sorts of morphogenesis of the telencephalon, and, and people have not yet started to think about it in a practical yeah. way. To how do I look for my for my primordia, or how do I look for my homologous parts? And, and I, I feel that uh, Isabel is starting to think in the, in the correct way, that's my opinion. But uh, there are many other people that uh, have no, no, mm -hmm. no, clue, no clue about yeah. that. And that's a big so, problem. Regarding to that, uh, in all our analysis, usually uh, we follow the radial glial, so GFAP markers. Uh, we try to follow that, that kind of logic, as, as Luis has said. Um, one th big thing, and that I didn't mention because I didn't have time, is that actually sharks have olfactory bulbs laterally instead of rostrally. So this actually distorts the topology, and we try to also take that into account, right? Uh, however, at some point of the rostrocaudal levels, that's quite, quite of uh, fits with mouse, and other points don't fit that much. So we always try to, to follow that. Um, uh, glial ray and and make sense of the model with, with that axis, right? So that ventricular PL axis. And there is works uh, from Alberto um, and Docampo that, that show that GFAP and how this uh, interpretation of the pattern has been done. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a very uh, important point. So yep. if I can ask, can I ask a question? Okay, so in in mammals, there's the globus pallidus internus. These are cells, cluster of cells within it, expresses somatostatin, projects to the lateral habenula, uh, and has both V glute, both glutamatergic and gabaergic. It, it's been very well studied. The presence of somatostatin in the was shown ages ago by Vincent. Um, it turns out there's an identical, perfectly homologous pathway cells in the tibial stage. So, metastatic containing cells projecting to the ventral habenula, uh, the Japanese group, uh, uh, Okamoto, has shown the projection is identical. And we've shown some metastatic containing in, in telios fish. So, I'm wondering have you ever looked? to find some statin containing cells in subpallium and i think you'd find they're there and they project down to lateral habenula that would be the i think the key marker that might make that strange looking subpallium more sense i'd like to comment on that that that's that, that is a very complicated point because the other all the literature is is misleading the, the, the chapters on subpallium start by telling you that the internal globus pallium is homologous to this or that. And usually that first sentence is in the chapters is wrong. 
it's not true what they say. It's completely wrong. So this this cell group that you mentioned that exists in this some has this projection in some of the, it exists, of course. It's very very common and seen in practically all vertebrates that have been looked at, but they are not in the subpallium. They are not a subpallial cell group, they are hypothalamic cells. So they exist. They, and they do, do have these common projections and this common chemical pattern, but they are not subpallial. They are not in the telencephron. They are born outside the telencephron and are not pallidal. So what is wrong is calling them pallidal. That is wrong. It's a semantic problem. The error is semantic because the cells exist. They are there and they project to the venula, of course, but they are in the hypothalamus. They are not subpallium. It's a different story. It's a different story. And the chapters in all the books are wrong on that point. Every book you open on the mammalian brain about the internal pallium in rodent, the first sentence is wrong. The first sentence in the chapter. That sentence is wrong. That's what they tell you. Just have a look at literature. Nowadays, there are data already showing what my, my point. That, that, but many other people have not yet got into the picture. So, so I noticed in your schema, the schema you send us, then you have this cell group there, and I noticed the problem there. So it's, it's true, maybe this cell group has to be in, inserted, being the hypothalamus belongs to the basal ganglia circuit in any case, and relates to motor control. I don't say that it does not relate to motor control, but what I say is it's not subpallial, should not be put under the umbrella of subpallium. It's something else. And it exists also in primates and humans in all vertebrates. This, this, they, they are, they are, I, I prefer to call them endopedancular uh, nuclei. They are interstitial to the peduncle as it comes out of the telencephalon and crosses through the hypothalamus. In that hypothalamic area, interstitial to the peduncle, that's where you have these cell groups, which are just outside the telencephalon. They are endopedancular in the hypothalamus. So that that's a, and there are data now genetic and with uh, with modern connectivity data showing that they are not pallida, that they are not at all pallida. But it's an error that you inherit when you open these book chapters because that's the first thing that the books tell you. That's the problem. So literature sometimes is confusing. Uh, if I mean we had a question by Luis Pessoa. Uh, that wanted actually to, that Luis have a take on Paul's question about the connections of the pallium. Uh, uh, so Luis, if you can, or, I mean, maybe Paul can remind the, the question and Luis can answer. Um, this is the question that I posed to uh, Doya. Uh, what her, her opinion, opinion is about, is about the, the conservative versus convergent uh, pattern of projections out of the pallium. Uh, projections from the pallium out of the telencephalon, which of course are a big part of mammalian uh, motor control uh, and in birds, uh, ap apparently absent in amphibians, but they're, you know, documented in lamprey as well as sharks to my knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess uh, Louise, wanted to know what Luis, um, what his take is on those, on that issue. I'd also love to hear your opinion too. I did not get the question, sorry. If it's- I think you, 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 you ask me how common or how um, the, the pallial, uh, connections outside from the telencephalon, paleomotor connections are common within chondrictians. I said, I am not sure if that's a general trend in chondrictians. And I'm not, I don't know if maybe Luis knows about this or someone in the audience. I, I would say that the general opinion of the experts is that the, um, already in lamprey you start to get a sort of a common uh, circuitry and after you enter into natostones then everything is there all the types of main types of connections are are common and shared so and yeah, also it's, it's, it's not just motor connections but and, and, the, and the molecular and, and, and also there is a sharedness of the molecular identity of the 
cell populations that are interconnected and so on. So that's important because, uh, I mean, uh, normally you have the, the main circuit moving from cortex into internal polygon from there to thalamus, so the so-called, uh, I don't remember the name in English now, but so so you have a in, in, uh, pallidal inhibition of the thalamus, and then you have uh, the disinhibition that is exerted by striatal. This main circuit of the of the basal ganglia that is already in stones perfectly well conserved, and you have your subthalamic nucleus, and you have your external pallidum, and you have the endopedonclear nuclei, and you have many other accessory parts of the circuits that are all, all of them are there, extending all the way into a hindbrain. Now he's asking, I'm passing you his questions. He's asking, is this vertebrate or pre-vertebrate? No, no, this vertebrate, vertebrate. Because uh, non-vertebrates uh, have a, practically don't have a telencephalon. <laughs> so telencephalon is a, a thing that starts with vertebrates. Okay, uh, so we have actually... Alex, who um, we are almost done. Uh, well, I don't know if you want to follow Luis Pessoa's question, or or we we move on to to Alex's question. Uh, I think that was it uh, from Luis. Correct me if I'm wrong. Up, up to recently, it was thought by many people in the field that, but if you go to cyclostomes, to lampreys and so on, that this uh, had a uh, lacked a pallidal component in their basal ganglia, that they only had striatum-like structure and preoptic area structure. But uh, in recent studies, it has been shown that actually the pallidal component appears a bit, develops a bit later in development, but it's, uh, in the adult is there. So that the, the the whole circuit is there even in in lampreys. So so that's a general conclusion in modern times. I muted or... Yeah, you can you can talk. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, so I was just curious about this limb expressing or this limb that you mentioned, Idoya, yeah, that you find in in sharks. Was curious about if it is it's expressed to some kind of cell similar to the cajal residue cells we find on on mammals, and if it has something to do, with that, some degree on lamination in in shark value. I don't know if if you can if you have seen this this function of this really in, in during development. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's super interesting, and that's the first thing it made me think when I saw this real in uh, region. So we have not characterized yet the cells that express it. The only thing uh, we did, and this was many years ago during my PhD, was was a correlation in the position of this real in expressing area with what we consider the dorsal pallium, and what it seems to be the end of uh, the migration from the subpallium. So it's possible that these neurons are actually gabbergic. Um, we are not sure. Now with molecular data, with single cell, I will ask all these questions, hopefully. So we post it because that's, right. uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, about the lamination, well, the general assumption is that they don't have a laminated encephalon, right? Uh, but what you consider lamination is also a bit, uh, let's yeah, say, you, relative, yeah. right? Uh, I've shown you this uh, hematoxylin use in let's say, pile of nuclei on top of each other. Are those lamina? We don't really know. We don't have uh, any, any detailed study about this. Uh, so all we can say up, in, up to now is correlation of expression. Uh, but it's interesting that it's in the same place, so whether it's coincidence or whether it's an structure that was there already. Uh, yeah, things that I would like to explore. Uh, it's the TBR2 cells that you also find that seems to be something that could either be convergently evolved or concept since very early vertebrate evolution yeah yeah absolutely could be both at this okay. point okay thanks but but on the, on the other hand you have to know that birds practically don't do not have uh, this system of cells 
they have a big telencephalon and thus the bears are supposed to be intelligent animals, but they don't have uh, practically any car neurons in their in their pallium. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is why I was curious because I thought it was something that was just present in mammals. So but no, I have I have I have seen recently a paper which maybe no impress or maybe it's out of reading that showing that in frogs this also has been shown that there could be a a, a source of car residues neurons in frogs. So nice. maybe it's, it's some primordial thing that maybe have been lost in reptiles and birds or something like that. So who knows? Well, a reptiles do have also car residues cells, only that they are not homogeneous everywhere. They are they are then denser in some places of the pallium than in others, and the same happens in the frog. I, I case I saw, but the birds seem they simply seem to either they get diluted and maybe they are there, but there are few of them and you don't see them practically. Yeah, and maybe they are not enough to. Or, or they or they have disappeared, they have lost their functions. Some there's some alternative way in which you organize the pallium. Yeah, and they are not enough to to promote this lamination. So. But the, like the, the important the important point is that that, that mammals the proper cortex is uh, organized inside out. Whereas yeah. all other pallia, dorsal pallia that you have in all other uh, glantostomes, they are organized outside in. Yeah, so this is big, what I was curious about, which is the, the function. The, the, the big point in evolution for the origin of the cortex, as we call it in mammals, was the change into from outside in into inside out. And we know very little about that problem. We know very little about how that occurs. What is the developmental mechanism that in, in, inverts the order in which the, the the generation of, of neurons are, are stabilized. So I'm wondering if I could ask you something about that, Luis. Um, in the, the idea of this weird developmental process in teleosts with the aversion, one, pro, one proposal is, is that be, they became really small for a period of time. And what, as they became, when they became small and then grew again, they, they sort of, came up with this different way of enlarging the telencephalon. Do you think that the, the this inside out issue in mammals could have been sort of triggered by the same, um, the same kind of circumstances? Because mammals became really small for a period of time uh, upon becoming nocturnal. And perhaps, you know, this is complete speculation I, and nobody can possibly say the answer, but I'm just wondering whether it's sensible s speculation or not, that maybe this inside out thing was just, they became so tiny and then when they became big again, it just it just had the op op possibility of now. Just I, 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 find it, I don't think that it can be so easy uh, that mm -hmm. just being small and becoming big is that that's too superficial relative to what you, is implicit in in inside out organization because it means that the the if there is a signal at the surface. Uh, like the heart rate of neurons, then the, the, the neurons, the newborn neurons need to be able to sense the source of the signal and they have, need to have surface uh, receptors or whatever to react to the signal and to stop when they reach a particular concentration of the signal. So, so the, the story has to be a bit complicated and deals with adhesivity uh, reaction to signals at a distance and stabilization of the movement of the of the neuron and so on. So this is a complicated thing that in, implies co control of this of the cytoskeleton and the movement of the neuron uh, by signals at the cell membrane. And I suppose that you need changes in, in a, mutations in number in a number of molecules, not only one. You, you probably need to change uh, several things in order to be able to move from outside in into inside out. So that's mm -hmm. it's not changing one molecule. You are changing several or, or hundreds of them. I don't know how many, but it's a complex problem. I think, I think that's my, my impression. That, mm -hmm. That's why there can be alternative solutions that, that reptiles move into birds and they move into mammalian patterns. Uh, in the case of birds, keeping the outside in pattern, also mm -hmm. reptiles have started to produce a lamination. Birds mm -hmm. lost that, lost the lamination that was there in reptiles. So that means that there are several different path pathways in which development can organize a pallium. And still, you can get your inputs and outputs, and your computations and your intelligence. So, yeah. uh, so it's a very complicated question. 
I would nice. like to just follow up on the reeling uh, thing. What what do you think reeling is doing in uh, amphibians? You said it's present there. It, it appears to be concentrated in cells in the lateral pallium. And uh, it doesn't seem to spread into other parts of pallium, but but this lateral pallial position also appears in reptiles. So it seems to be as, it, as there was a main initial stopping or act, or active point of cajal residue cells coming from elsewhere that the first accumulate in the lateral pallium. And then they spread out in mammals or whatever into other places doing some. So there's like several steps in the evolutionary uh, entrance of the cajal residue cells into the picture, so to speak. So that's my impression that in, in amphibian reptiles we see sort of an initial step of having a local concentration of this cell somewhere in the cortex. And then it's, it either it disappears in birds or expands to all the cortex in, in mammals. That seems to be the picture as I see it. But don't ask me what are the causes. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I think it's complicated. Many molecules are changing. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we are five minutes over the time, uh, so maybe I think we lost Len. Len, I don't know if you're around. Oh, okay, right here. <laughs> Just to say goodbye to to the audience. Uh, thank you all for. No, I'm still here. I'm still yeah, here. Thank you all for the questions. Thank you all for being there. I hope we you guys enjoy as much as we did, and um, we will put this in YouTube at some point, and we'll have the next session in around two months i believe raquel you can not yeah apparently it's around two months okay okay thanks a lot so bye bye bye, bye. thank you doya bye thank, thank you, you doya <laughs>